Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Curious Competitor podcast. Uh, our guest today is a neuroscientist by trade, co-founder of Peak Brain, uh, based in LA, New York City, St. Louis. Where am I missing, Dr. Hill? We have London and Stockholm as well. London and Stockholm. Well, actually, I, Sweden's been on my summer training list for, for a while. I have a lot of Swedish friends, so maybe I'll, I'll visit the clinic over there. St. Louis would probably be the closest to me. I'm local to Chicago, uh, but I've been a part of... Uh, I did a QEG. Dr. Hill will explain a little bit about, you know, what that means. Um, and I have uh, began my remote neural feedback training with Dr. Hill and his team, which has been uh, very impressive on the business side. Just totally amazed at, at how, you, how turnkey you've been able to, to create that and, and make smooth what otherwise can be a, a pretty clunky process. Uh, Dr. Hill, thanks for coming on. Of course. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, Dr. Hill, when you took a look at my QEG. We mentioned we were talking a little bit off air prior. Um, yeah. You had mentioned you had some findings, which would, I guess, not be abnormal, but some of the findings were abnormal. So, what, what, uh, walk us through kind of what yeah. a QEG is, and then how my brain was was presenting. Sure. So, one thing to know about when you're looking at human focused data is that people are weird. I mean, people are unusual. So good job. Be weird. First of all, by itself, we don't really care about some arbitrary metric. It's always about the context and does it, does it serve your goals or is something in the way? Is there a bottleneck, et cetera? So, you know, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. So I play this trick of putting physiology and performance in contrast and looking for what sticks out. It's a, it's a performance driven, a functional performance driven assessment, but using sort of classic cognitive neuroscience tools. So we had you did an executive function test, which is basically being bored for 20 minutes. And then we had you do a resting assessment where we mapped your brain, put a cap on the head, uh, squirt it full of gel, and you sat still for about 15, 20 minutes or so. Half of that eyes closed, half of that eyes open. So that's the basic assessment to get resting sort of data and the performance, the attention stuff is a little variable day to day, but it's easy to interpret. The brain maps are pretty stable day to day. You know, it's a fingerprint of resources, but they're hard to interpret because people are weird. So how much theta or alpha or how fast your brain waves are is a true thing looking at your data. But what it means compared to the average person your age sometimes isn't quite as discreet. So we have to play this game where we look at your performance, find big outliers, constrain some ideas, go to your brain, find some interesting phenomena, see if they match and start to narrow down until you can find things you care about. You know, sitting down with your coach across your DEXA scan and functional strength assessment and, you know, figuring out where the weak parts are and where you're going to shave time and where strength needs to happen, essentially. So we have data we can look at, but we did executive function testing where we flashed a number on the screen or spoke it over the speakers for about once per second for 20 minutes. It's just literally unloading your resources and then doing transient little pushes, to changing gears on the stimuli to see if you can pump the gas, you know, activation tone of your resources and pump the brakes, the inhibition of your resources. And for you, we saw really, really strong performance, you know, standard deviation and a half or more above average for how on you can be. Your vigilance, your background focus, your quickness, really high. Sort of makes sense based on some of your, you know, skills and training. But you got to sports car brain in that aspect. We also look at how well you can pump the brakes and not activate when a distractor pops up. This is called response control. You can also think of it as being automatic or reactive or a bit impulsive or something. And you had a really unusual kind of phenomena here where you had really good scores, except after about 15 minutes toward the end of that test, you you flared out in terms of self-control. So you were able to pump the brakes on that two that kept popping up at a higher and better level than average. And you had something called prudence or carefulness to monitor and adjust that was much better than average. And yet your stamina to pump the brakes, your ability to sit there and hold that inhibitory tone every moment actually wore out throughout the test. And you got more tired essentially and that resource was harder so this is like a high stress if you're out in, you know, in a play environment and you're in a high stress environment making decisions mixing the activation inhibition there's some evidence that if you do that for 20 minutes straight your performance is going to start tailing off in specific information processing grabbing information quickly shifting gears that kind of stuff so super high performer with a couple of opportunities and fatigue essentially of the resources to maybe optimize.
Which I think is what drew me. Uh, Elisa Haggerty, who was with Parsley Health at the time, she's no longer with uh, them, Was uh, had a, a serious concussion, and, and she was the one that introduced me to Peak Brain. But it was this phenomenon I was experiencing where I, I do feel very high-functioning, uh, high-intensity as an athlete. I, I'd say I'm also... Um, you know, very creative, like ideas tend to flow, you know, through me, uh, particularly in the early half of the day. But this, this bonking, this zonking, this uh, unavailability, you know, really in the family life, let's say from 2 p.m. until 6 p.m., some of that was blood sugar related, you know, if I wasn't eating enough or, you know, things like that. And, and I try to, you know, be good with my diet and things like that. But under the hood, I, I was very curious about, you know, this executive function. I, I just felt like I would I would achieve a state where life was now coming at me and I wasn't mm. really playing with it uh, like I was in, in the first bit of the day. Yeah, I think that makes sense because you have to sort of white knuckle your resources and step on the gas a little bit, you know, push a little harder. I, I, I will say that other stuff in your brain, so that was the performance I was describing, extremely powerful with a little bit of fraying fatigue. But the brain maps um, look a little more classic in terms of um, a couple big features jumping out. When I say classic, I mean these things are called phenotypes or, or patterns in your data. They're real things. Whether or not they mean for you, what they often mean is sort of open for discussion. You'll know, but we have certain things we can measure that are really there. Um, a couple of yours that I think you probably care about, one of them in particular is your alpha waves, your, your idling speed of your brain was dragging in the map by one and a half standard deviations. You're running slower in internal processing speed than you should for a person your age. And aspects of your performance are so high that I don't really expect to be using average as the metric for you anyways. So if you're dragging alpha, you know, this, this internal lag for, for thinking, for clarity, you know, probably is a bit of brain fog creeping up. Yeah. Um, you may have a touch of classic, uh, speed of processing difficulties, which, you know, I'm like twice your age. I have a, if, if I had that alpha speed dragging and spreading out, I'd be experiencing delayed recall for words and names and tip of the tongue stuff, little short term memory, loading blips. And that can happen sometimes. Uh, but I'm guessing brain fog, non-specific, kind of low key tiredness and some stamina issues, bonking, like you said, in the afternoon. That's sort of what I would predict from your your alpha waves running slower than average. The, the name anxiety is definitely something I've experienced heavily. Yeah, reaching for names and words and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So we see some of that stuff. And then we all, and, and that's in some of uh, the speeds of alphas and things. Uh, I, have, I have pictures for all of this, by the way, all prepared for you. So just say the Thank word you. and I'll, I'll show them. But uh, you can also share them with your people on a show notes kind of format too. Um, there's a couple other things to talk about in your brain maps. And one of them is, um, some extra beta waves, some little, you know, activated tone, if you will, little, little resources that are kind of strong, but might be a touch uncomfortable. And then there's some brain waves where you're making extra theta brain waves, a couple of different places. And that can mean that the brain's a bit more automatic and those circuits are kind of doing their own thing and harder to control. So one is too sloppy and not inhibited enough, perhaps, and one might be kind of tight and hard to relax, like a muscle that's feeling either weak or spasmy and a muscle that's feeling kind of cramped, a little bit of a different relationship to the activation, you know. So uh, your beta waves, beta is a gas pedal, a gear, you use beta voluntarily, you're kind of aware of it, you think with it, you feel with it all the stuff that's sensory is beta. Largely the conscious mind is a beta phenomena and it's, it's in the teens and up for hertz or cycles per second. And your beta, uh, now let me just stop folks who, who don't know our process for a second. This is cold information, meaning I'm not sort of saying, hey, where, give me all the different medical history, please. And you know, I kind of know you're a sports guy and you do stuff on the ice, which is pretty awesome. But, you know, I, I have a sense, okay, he's an athlete. He's got his bell rung once or twice, you know. Uh, hockey has a certain uh, uh, a spot in my heart, too. I grew up uh, in Maine, and when I was little, I had a set of Bobby Hell skates autographs. Yep. So, you know, I, was, I, uh, I, I have a, a good spot in my heart for hockey. But not real, no real clear sense of, like, are you an athlete who's gotten injured before or anything like that. So this is all kind of cold in terms of predicting stuff. That being said, there are some spots in your brain where you make a lot of beta waves and they're toward the midline, especially the back midline. There's a little, little bit in the front, mostly in the back. And these are called the cingulate cortices, the anterior and posterior cingulate, front and back. And the cingulate switch your focus around. Now, generally the front of the brain is the inside self. 
what you're thinking about internally. And the back of the brain is about the outside world. And the cingulates and switchers sort of facilitate your focus on the inside self and the outside world. Where your posterior cingulate, which is kind of activated a little bit, that's the part of the brain that does stuff like watch the road, heads up, heads up, frisbee. You know, the orienting, the alerting and reorienting to the outside world. That circuit, that tissue, that resource has a sort of evaluation responsibility in real time as it's starting to orient to the stuff you got to pay attention to. When we learn the world is not especially predictable or a little unsafe, that part of the brain can cramp up a little bit. And we tend to produce something we call rumination, where we're stuck in our gut a little bit and worried. and It's hard to put that down sometimes. So I don't know if that's true for you, but I would predict it's plausible. What do you think? Is that something you deal with sometimes? Yeah, you haven't missed on on really any of these. And, and the the reason I've always been curious about the well-being of my brain is, is I've spent, you know, countless hours in, in a gym and, you know, preparing my body and working on my game and, and honing my craft, uh, you know, on the ice. I've been a pro for 11 years. I've played, you know, hundreds and hundreds of games. I don't even know what the number is. And I get this question at family parties and, you know, anywhere, you know, how, how's your health? Like, what's, what's going on? You know, how, how's your concussion history? You know, and I've never missed a game. Now, now I've taken some nasty hits and I, but I've never been, uh, obviously symptomatic to myself or others, but you know, I'll be uh, turning 30 next April. And I'm like, I, I really am not positive. Um, you know, quality of life, uh, you know, some of this underlying quiet anxiety, the rumination you're, you're speaking of uh, about, you know, the, the topic isn't I have a, a few favorites, but it's not totally topic dependent. You know, it could be whatever flavor of the week, whatever's on my plate. Um, and I, I think I realized just the extent to which I was trying to train the body and, and the little bit of juice I was getting out of that lime. And it was like, what if I could look at this problem from the side or upside down and, and really look at, um, you know, the, the peripheral nervous system, this is something I learned on a podcast, uh, I think it was on the Ben Greenfield podcast, where you discuss this concept of the nervous system that's outside of bone versus inside of bone. This was not something I, I knew previously. Uh, and I'm into trying to understand HRV like everybody else. I'm into breath work. I, you know, have meditated daily for, you know, multiple years. And I'm curious what that means to you. I know what it means to me currently. Um, you know, but this concept of influencing the central nervous system is not something I'd had explained to me. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very excited and, and, uh, fortunate to have a close friend who's advocated for what this can look like in, in real day-to-day life. Like it's a, it's a real thing to be able to go, you know, kind of mechanically go in and, and shift gears a bit. And, and it's also, while maybe it's a bit mysterious and not something that you fully understand, it's also not at all a blind phenomena. You've actually been training your CNS. I mean, the first time you started hitting the gym, you know, the first six or eight weeks was not really about your muscles. It was central nervous system adaptation to heavy lifting and to straining the system that way so it could learn to adapt. So you've been giving that system feedback since you were a baby flopping around and did a baby push up and went, whoa, I can see 12 feet from this angle. Holy cow, information. And you learn that association of neurons. At that point, that's feedback. That's the same associative learning process we use in neurofeedback to push the brain around gently and stretch those resources. But in the key, the, the, the piece of it I think you might be tripping over, which I love, is that, hey, look, you can look at your brain and you can learn some things about yourself that are somewhat transparent at a high level. Like, for instance, I could see that alpha speed uh, being draggy, which is that delayed recall for information. Now, I appreciate that it's just a resource and we definitely should change it and we'll go after it with you. But, you know, being not quite 30, that's kind of a lot of drag and speed. Like if you were 45 or 50 with word finding issues, yeah, okay, whatever, normal, typical stuff. Maybe don't tolerate it, but it's closer to like bone density and some abdominal fat than it is a true difficulty. But at 29, 30 years old, you know, you're dealing with a a bottleneck in resources and it's worth working out, so to speak. Um, So we saw that when we saw the the back midline beta, which is a bit of that lifeguard in high gear. There's a touch of front midline, not quite as activated, but the front midline is the anterior cingulate. And when the anterior gets a little bit activated, we tend to uh, think of the same things again and again. So we perseverate or get a little obsessive. So 
you know, your mind sometimes I would guess is playing ping pong with sort of stuff that bothers you. Did you hear? I heard. Did you worry? I'm worrying. Did you hear? I heard. And you know, stuff probably resonates here and there sometimes when it starts to bother you. So the cingulates are part of the default mode network, the self reflective awareness. You're smiling because it's true, right? Some of this stuff rings well, true. Yeah, I, I am. And, and you, you, I have opportunities. I, I did a, uh, a genomics profile uh, to, to understand epigenetically. Uh, I think the company was Utrients with, uh, I think it was years ago, Dr. Mahmoud Muhammad. It was awesome. Very much like uh, speaking with you, totally in the dark, gave my genetic profile. And for an hour, we had a phone call where he told me about me and, you know, he, he didn't miss. And, and we, we integrated, you know, a lot of different practices that have made my life better, made my performance better, made my marriage better. Um, and, and this is, uh, you know, maybe the nickname, it like the dog walking phenomenon, where I'll walk the whole dog and I'm like, oh my God, I, I just had the, this conversation did not stop from the second I stepped outside my door. Like I, I missed the trees. Uh, you know, <laughs> I didn't pay attention to anything else other than let's say it's a, I'm not happy with the way my skates are fitting right now. And I, I'm concerned that something new is coming up or um, a coach said something to me. And, and this came up in the epigenetics uh, conversation. Mm. He's like, you know, you, you're a perfect candidate uh, to do what you do, which is show up every day, this Kaizen concept of trying to get 1% better. He's like, that is not difficult for you. That is not boring for you. You have this ability to stick with something for a long time. He goes, you're a perfect candidate for marriage. You can really oh, wow. uh, find the same person interesting. He's like, I have you know certain candidates where he's like, if they don't have you know uh, game seven on the line, you know a million dollars on a poker game, they, they need this super high intensity life yeah. to not yeah. be bored yeah. stiff. Um, so it's, it's interesting to understand the contrast and come at the problem from different perspectives and you're picking up the same thing. Well, let's see if I can't guess one or two more things, uh, from your data. So you've got a blob of theta brain waves. Theta is, um, sort of automatic. It lets things release and turns the tissue on. So the tissue is very modular in the brain, the cortex, and it tends to operate in very small modules that do specific things and share their, their resources with other modules. And the modules turn on using beta, go into neutral using alpha, and release using theta. They take the brakes off using theta. You got a lot of theta, an awful lot, um, on the left mid part of the brain called the central cortex. And that part of the brain has a couple of really interesting qualities. And having a lot of theta there can get in the way. The primary way it can get in the way I don't see for you, which is kind of interesting. And that is... Uh, background focus or sustaining your attention when things are boring. I see not only not a problem in that, but a superlative, like a strength, a crazy powerful resource and just locking in and letting the information just, you know, absorb it without needing it to necessarily be highly intense. Kind of what you just described that your geneticist was able to pick up on this ability to lock in your, your focus really interestingly. Um, so that being said, the spot in the left side of the brain that makes theta for you and for many people, when it does that, it also gets in the way of something called sleep maintenance or staying deeply asleep and getting all of your rest, all your slow wave sleep built up while you're sleeping. So I would guess part of this alpha that's draggy and the word finding and some brain fog and some lack of reserve in the afternoon has a quality where you're actually a tiny bit asleep all the time when you're awake and you can't dive into the deepest sleep at night and maintain the deep chunks of deep sleep the same way as you might want to and so you end up a little bit like wired and tired all the time essentially yeah 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 the, the, the wired and tired phenomenon is really interesting because what what it feels like as an athlete is you'll you'll show up i i find it's it's slow to wake up so let's call it the first 10 to 15 minutes you know really slow um I, i'm a i've been evaluating my relationship with caffeine i've been known as a craft coffee guy i do like the chemex every morning i'm super into it everyone the habit's been reinforced. People gifted to me, you know, companies send things to me. So, so if I'm going to put the stops on that, this is a part of my identity that needs to die. And, and I, I've been chewing on it. That's besides, and, and I've, you know, I've listened you to the human you know, podcast. You, your, neuro, your neuroscientist would never countenance telling you to remove co coffee or caffeine without a serious cardiac or other problem to screen it out. No, no, I, coffee's good for you. I, I feel that way. And, and I, I, I I, I'm trying to make this podcast not a, well, what about for the next 90 minutes, <laughs> you know, next uh, no, 45 no, minutes. Or keep what drinking about, your coffee. You know, no, this no, no. is no trouble. Yeah. What about this? Um, so, and, and you show up to the gym, you're, you're in it, you're, you're ready to rock. And there is a fall off yeah. um, where you can maintain a certain level of intensity or, you know, decision-making 
and it is funny because you, I, I'm so, I'm strong enough in the gym and have enough experience. I can kind of fake it. I can, I can perform at a really high level and people may not know it was my best on the ice. It's, you know, CNS wise, it's a much higher demand. You're on these, you know, stilts, uh, you know, you're, you're at a threat for falling all the time. Like it's, it's, it's an extremely stressful sport being in, uh, you know, playing hockey. And that's where I, I get this really honest feedback of, um, you're not your best flat out. And so it, it, it is really interesting that you're saying, and, and do you think a lot of this is innate? And I know we're speaking for the first time and this is the first QEG of mine you're seeing, or could some of this revolve around the fact I take as much impact as I do in, in concussion history? Is this a, is this a combo? Yeah, it's a mix. Um, the dragging speed of processing is not your native speed that's acquired. I don't know if it's because you're too stressed out and aren't sleeping deeply or a couple bits of wear and tear have produced some residual, you know, delta, which means you can't sleep deeply, but there's a fog phenomena that looks acquired. I don't know why it's there. You know, it's just as likely to be, if I didn't know you were a hockey player who was at a high level and got your bell rung a few times here and there historically, I would believe that it was basic concussion. I would believe that it was fatigue. I would believe it was concussion or COVID or chemo or mold or Lyme or there's about a thousand things that create brain fog and they're kind of non-specific at an EEG level. You can kind of tell something's going on, but you can't really tell exactly what or why it's there. Now you don't have to know what or why it's there because you're trying to spot a phenomenon you care about. If I'm like, oh, wow, there's some fog here. Are you foggy? And you're like, yeah, well, then you care about it. Great. Let's push it around. We don't really care why it's there unless something's keeping it stuck, you know. Um, but with your history, there's some plausible reasons for it, especially to the patterns of your theta and some of the other slow brain waves. While you do have a blob of it in the left side for sleep maintenance and depth of sleep and strong clarity and things, you've also got a lot of theta across the back of the head. When you close your eyes, it kind of just swells up into big slow brain waves and goes kind of idle back there. And it's oddly sort of turning off. It's oddly sleepy. And I think what we're probably seeing is, you know, some of the thing related to the fog you're experiencing. And it's somewhat plausible that you fell back and hit your head at some point, um, especially when doing skates. I have fallen back and hit my head on the ice as a kid. Like I have done that injury as a 10 year old, you know, who didn't know how to stop on skates yet and was, you know, way outclassed on the ice. Um, uh, back in the, in the, uh, late seventies, early eighties, before we had helmets, even mandatory for the peewee leagues and things, you know? So, um, it's plausible there that you have a lot of this visual tissue, in the back of the head that, that browns out the powers down when you close your eyes cause it's tired essentially. So I see the sleep maintenance, I see the fatigue, I see the brain stressing. The other big thing I'm seeing is there's um, theta, more of this automatic release phenomena happening toward the front right of the head. And I don't know if this feature is important to you or not. Um, you're making lots of theta there, but again, it could be nothing, it could be interesting. The, the frontal lobes and the corners here, they kind of operate together. The dorsolateral, the, the, the edges here on the corners of the, the frontal lobe, left and right. And you can think of them like, a, like a, the, the porch of a house with a happy little kid on the left going, hey world, come here, I want some, I want to get into it. And on the right front corner, there's a grumpy old man going, meh, meh, go away, this all sucks, leave me alone, too hard, no, that's going to suck. And it's the approach versus the avoid system you balance based on how resourced, energetic, interested, excited you might feel safe, you know, um, you, having lots of theta on the right front corner kind of means that grumpy old man has gone worse than grumpy. And now he's actually kind of frozen up a little bit and feeling overwhelmed at times. So I would guess that at times, just from the data that you maybe um, get a sense of dread that creeps in and kind of a heaviness and a, not a quick anxiety, but like a weighty kind of anxiety. Does that sound somewhat plausible? Yeah. And, and so I only have my mind to kind of uh, remember back to, you know, what sort of brain status was I at? What physically did I feel like? And I'll keep old, um, you know, hockey footage, old training footage, uh, uh, old gear around just in case I pick something up, you know, maybe my stick's gotten long and that's weird. I'm not sure why that that's happened. I'm having a tough time with pucks in my feet. Um, or, you know, I'm not, I'm not moving well. Let me see, you know, what in the past has, has really worked well for me. And I, I it, I call it like this. Um, I have talked about this with other people on the podcast as well. Like hell is there's a, there's a special place in hell where you 
uh, have stressors or goals and you you don't want to take action again, you know, towards them, but you also don't want to kind of take your medicine and rest either. So it's like you you don't want to partake in stress, but you don't not want to partake in stress. And that is not, that's a handcuff. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think there we often want to try, you know, you're pushing back, you're trying towards, you're always, the effort is so, especially for an athlete who's, you know, you're, you have in your blood this, this desire to lean in, lean through, develop, excel, break boundaries. So having to manage some of those limits in a, in a real way and move through them, you know, but again, for the brain, I don't want you thinking about when I show you your brain stuff, you know, historically, uh, and, and, and deeply, we often find problems. We find difficulties like I, that back midline can get in the way. That can be a little bit annoying. And there's a few other things that are probably annoying, but because we see them in your maps, this is kind of no different than looking at, you know, some functional stuff you want to change in your body and going, yeah, let's work on that bone density or that, you know, muscle strength in that arm or whatever. That's a little lag in these days. So you can think of, you know, this is closer to rehab for the, t- the twisted knee or something that you have to deal with more than, um, fixing a disease process because most of the things we deal with in our brain, I mean, these cingulates are not disease processes for you. They're powerful and a little uncomfortable because that happens. You know, the back midline can be a lifeguard who's enjoying it. It can be a bit of a, of a trauma response, a threat sensitivity as well, or anything in between. And the front midline can be a highly focused CEO or it can be a little OCD or both, or neither. It can just work fine for you at its you know, more active than average level. So as you navigate your brain data, look through things and see big features, the stuff to focus on is sort of like, oh, I want to change that. Not so much, oh my God, something's different than average, or there's something in the way. Because people are a little bit unusual. So the gross stuff, the big stuff from your brain maps are this fatigue phenomena. I think the, um, to kind of get back to your question about acquired versus you know innate, uh, the anxiety stuff, the front midline, the back midline, you've also got some activation behind the right ear, part of the brain called the temporoparietal junction, which I call the princess and the pea, because it kind of maps the world into the mind. And when it's kind of active, you like can't miss any subtle sensory things, your friend chewing from six blocks away and that dog barking, you know, at the neighbor's house, you all kind of drink it in. Um, these are superpowers. You, this is a special kind of human brain, the brilliant, kind of on, on, you know, fire a tiny bit, kind of hot, you know, maybe ADHD, maybe anxious, maybe a little bit, you know, out there in extreme human performance, maybe all that at once. And none of the labels really fit. Like you looked impulsive on the performance test and yet you were performing better than most humans somehow, like just right at the edge you were fraying. But up until that moment, you are way out in the bell curve in your performance, which isn't a thing that attention usually does. It doesn't just tire out. Mm, so mm. you develop this ability to, you know, bear down with some very powerful resources. So you probably started off able to scan the world and evaluate better than most people, hyper-focus better than most, drink information in, and then for all that theta that's in the middle cortex, central cortex, that's your ability to go boom, pattern, boom, interesting information, and shift to the novelty, shift to the pattern. When that gets extreme, we call it ADHD, but yours is an ADHD level. It's just sort of just below that and operating almost like a superpower. And my guess is if you hadn't have uh, had had some concussion history or sleep quality issues or whatever's going on with the fog, this would all be just serving you and not in the way. And that's the difference between, you know, looking at your brain with a doctor and your coach and your scientists, it's, I'm, I'm here to teach you how to look at your data and we'll do that, you know, privately and offline deeply probably, but, um, I'm here to teach you to read your data so that you become your own expert. And, you know, hopefully in a few weeks we'll get your speed of processing back up and your quality of sleep and making you feel chill and balanced and poised and focused, but great. That's all stuff we do in our feedback. I'm a little more concerned about like systemically and, and for, for benefit for you, that you know how to look at your brain data next year, the year after, the year after that, so that as you control the machine and pull the levers and build the resources and stretch stuff and, you know, maybe get another concussion, you have tools to navigate what's going on and you don't have to sort of like find the right doctor who has the right answer. That's the problem with doctors. They have to be right. You know, coaches, coaches don't have to be right. They have to iterate. 
they're, they're heading you towards your goals. They're seeing what works. They're trying things. They're, they're functionally focused. And scientists aren't right. They're trying to disprove things. You know, A lot of your brain map review is like, um, here's the thing that's plausible. Can we disbelieve that? Oh, we can't. Oh, that's annoying. That one, that, that one's annoying. Okay, you experienced that? Mm, all right. You know, we're trying to like knock down ideas, not sort of shoehorn in the diagnostic labels that I figured out about you from into data. You know, that that's not the directionality here. So once people stop being attached to like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? Which label is it? What are the unusual features? I, you know, once you get away from that perspective, you can start thinking about your brain activity, kind of like your lipid panel or your personal, you know, records in the, in the gym or whatever you're noticing. For your case, you've identified the, um, the pinnacle of CNS, PNS, automatic, motor, premotor. You, you identified that when you're on your skates on the ice doing that thing. It takes everything. Uh, I, uh, among the hardest sports to do is baseball. Among the hardest things a human ever has to do is hit an actual baseball. So when you're not on the ice, I encourage you to go and stretch yourself in a batting cage and see what you notice there. Because it's going to stretch you some, some similar stuff, but because you're not in motion, it's almost going to give you another background on the backdrop of like intervention or testing to figure out where things are changing. So, you know, yeah, I, play, I played one. baseball till I was about 15 at a pretty high level. We had some guys go on and play pro and quite a few division one players. So, and I think it's this, um, so I will do that. I'm, I'm very excited. Maybe we're just in that hitting a, hitting a ball coming at you 90 miles an hour is among the hardest things a, oh, yeah. a, an, ath an athlete will ever have to do as a human body. It's right up there. So um, I, those are the big things. There's some stressy stuff that's probably built in because you're brilliant and one of those you know, humans who drinks in all the information and tends to get a little bit on edge because of it. And then there's the fatigue stuff. But I think what this means is the stressy stuff is um, compensatory. The way mm. we're seeing it lit up and kind of cramped up is a compensatory resource. You pushing through the fog and fatigue and you're doing it just fine. Executive function I cannot see the fog and fatigue in your performance unless I look very, very, very carefully and see hints of it. Like you're really high performer. So that lets us really narrow in on the things that are dri driving fatigue and the brain maps that are likely to be most important for you. And that becomes the deltas and the alphas. So you're a sports car driving around with the emergency brake on and you've got your foot on the gas a little bit to make up for it. And you still get where you're going all the time, ahead of most cars most of the time. But you might have taken out a mailbox or two on the way there if you aren't careful, you know, kind of thing. So this is power. Yeah. I think it's this, um, I, I have used that uh, ability to pattern recognize and synthesize. On the nutrition side, to kind of sort through what's worked, what hasn't worked. I've tried, you know, more things than most, um, you know, failed with a bunch of them. I've done that on the physiological side. I'd say from a training perspective, I have a, you know, much deeper understanding than, than most players about what is it I'm trying to train? Um, what is it, you know, wh where am I screwing this up? How could I do better, less? Uh, how can I do more uh, to optimize re my results without doing as much busy work? But it's this celebration of agency because concussion in hockey, it, it does read like a death sentence today. And, and players are concerned. I get asked if, you know, I have a two-year-old son who might be waking up here in the next little bit. So hopefully we don't hear him. But, um, you know, people ask me, will he play? And I really ap applaud uh, the, the, the mission you're on. I think this was really a, a, a macro goal of the podcast. And I was sitting down today was selfishly, I'd, I'd love to learn how to train better and, and how to get some of this fatigue on um, and, and, and do all that. But I really want to invite the hockey community to consider their relationship with their brain uh, to be as plastic as it is with the body and, and that we can train it in these different ways. Um, and we might have to be just in... You know, 20 years ago, personal training was not commonplace in the NHL in, in pro hockey, and it's become so. Um, and, you know, maybe the next wave is is investigating who the right people, the right coaches are to equip yourself with in your performance team or in my performance team on the CNS side, on the nervous system side, um, on the meditation side, on the breathwork side. Uh, that might be, you know, a little bit less uh, mystical for people in terms of a point of entry. But um, I think that's... From a, from a zoom out perspective, what I've been most excited about. And, you know, in hockey too, it's not all or nothing. I mean, people ask me, if you had a kid, would you let them do X, Y, and Z sport? 
And I don't know is a short answer for some things. Like I'm not sure I'd send a kid down the path of football at this point, knowing what I know, or even soccer. And I work with NFL players and I work with international football players and, 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 you know, soccer players. There's a lot of joy and power and beauty in that game, in those athletes, in that, in that aspect of human performance. And I wouldn't want to take it away from those people and their path. But I think the repetitive head injury stuff, the stuff where it's built into the game, football and soccer, I, I, it's hard. And rugby, it's hard to, to countenance that. But you shouldn't really be getting too much body to body, you know, head impacts, ballistic stuff. Not as much. Yes, you do get some in, in hockey. But when you're really playing the game reasonably well, even a little aggressively, you shouldn't be bouncing off the ground too, too much. Yeah. And, and I, I, I mean, th- it's a big enough problem that it deserves to be attacked on all fronts, right? Like this should be a conversation around skills coaches. This should be a conversation around people with like, you know, Dr. Andrew Hill, there should be, there should be considerations every day with your, your personal trainer. If you're in there four or five days a week, this is something that, you know, deserves some, some free will, some attention pointed at it. But if it's not a thing you're like, if, if you're out there as a block and linebacker or whatever in football and you end up getting yourself hit, 60 times every game, it's hard to manage that level of risk and wear and tear. But if you're someone who gets their bell rung or, or, you know, gets in a fight every so often, you know, a couple times a year, you you have a mild concussion, you can manage that risk. I have a couple of professional skiers who about once every two to three years, they come in with a pretty significant concussion from the ski slopes. And usually it's off season and they rebuild their brain. And by the next season, they're competing again and they're able to, to compete comfortably knowing that they have a tool to address a concussion or some wear and tear, or if they need to, they can rebuild some stuff. They got assessment tools, they got re- you know, neurofeedback. So some of these folks, I, I, I'm okay with my skiers going back out there and getting back in. I have a couple of guys that are NFL players and they love it. And they're going back to play soon because we did neurofeedback. But that's the, the dignity of risk stuff. I'm not going to tell a, a hardcore athlete they can't go, you know, be hardcore. But in hockey, Hockey players are all kind of hardcore. You don't necessarily need to get concussed in the course of doing your job well. It happens. But it's not like necessarily going to happen. It's not the meat of the game. So, Completely agree. Yeah. So I sort of feel like now you have strategic resources to balance that risk. Like I would let a, a kid of mine play hockey or something else that may have head injuries but doesn't necessarily make that guaranteed necessarily. that you know Because if you get... You know, there's, there's studies showing in soccer, you do one heading drill for 20 minutes and you show concussion markers and elevated GABA for 48 hours and reduce memory oh. function for 48 hours from one heading drill in soccer. It's hard to send a kid into that environment with developing brain and all this stuff. But OK, you know, as long as the, the hockey league is reasonably polite and we aren't encouraging, you know, uh, a lot of aggression on the ice, I'm OK with it. I, you know, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be down with it. Um, but uh, the point is having those tools. It's, you know, it, it's, it's understanding how things work. It's knowing what the bottlenecks are, knowing what you go after. Uh, and then you can uh, decide about your level of risk, right? So it's funny. I, I used to say when people would ask, I'd be like, I don't know, maybe I'll point my kid to soccer or something. And then actually I came up on that data because it just seemed like a gentler sport. And then I really didn't consider the the heading, uh, you know, it's a being little as gentler for boys. It is. It's not gentler for girls. They get injured much higher. Um, huh. They have more damage and more injuries than, than boys do in soccer. Interesting. Because they're just as strong, but not quite as durable. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You know? So what is it? Let, let's discuss some of those tools. Uh, what is it about neurofeedback that you've, I mean, it's really your life's work at this point. Um, I know alongside other things. I mean, what is it you love so much about neurofeedback? I love that it makes change rapidly and that you feel the change. I mean, it's, it's this mysterious, but not at all blind phenomenon. If you start exercising your brain waves, you're like, yeah, whatever. This is some weird, wait, wait a minute. Huh? Oh, I feel a little different. Oh, Hey, wait, this is interesting. And it rapidly takes the, and, and, and you have to do it by validating that, you know, let's say I'm going to try to train your theta down the left side and your beta up on the left side for sustained focus and deeper sleep. What matters is not if I think it will work. It's did you get deeper sleep and do you feel really focused after the session? And if I hear that from you, great, let's do some more. And if four sessions in, you're like, well, doc, I'm a little too focused. I had a hard time turning my mind off and I couldn't fall. <laughs> okay, we've overshot a little bit. Let's back off. 
And this is kind of like calling your trainer from the Whole Foods and saying, dude, this egg's all over the floor. My arms are noodles. What are you doing to me? Okay, we'll back off on the curl bar. Sorry. Like when it comes to brain training, you, cr- you elicit effects in sleep, stress, attention, speed of processing, creativity, emotional access, and it gives you control over some of those things. And I, I, I really feel like a lot of the stuff involving the brain, the mind, we've pathologized and or we've talked about as if it's only problematic and most of the things the brain does that cramp up on us that get in the way are not diseases they're existing resources that are stuck in a mode front midline obsesses back midline ruminates behind the right ear has social or sensory irritability left side vigilance tissue tends to get in the way of uh, focus and deep sleep right side executive function tissue tends to get in the way of pumping the brakes when things are uh, distractible, you know, like squirrel kind of stuff, ADHD stuff is more right-sided. But these are all things that you can have a different relationship with. If I show you your brain activity, it stops being this thing happening to you or a label someone's given you or a big, giant, scary phenomenon you might be experiencing, and you have a perspective on it in data, and you know, you can be just as, as suffering, you can have just as much pain. The, the, the problem is just as real seeing once you see it in data, but it's kind of hard to feel guilty about it when you see it in data. It's kind of hard to be ashamed or as overwhelmed when you see your, like I can show your alpha speed running a standard deviation and a half below average. You know you're having a little bit of word finding and some sluggish processing when you're not loaded up with attention. It's not a new thing for you. I shouldn't tell you new stuff, but if I'm like, look, here it is, it's just your brain. What do you want to do about it? Is this important to you? It puts you in a different relationship with a bit of suffering because you know the mechanism. I teach you the neuroscience and I give you strategies to start going, hmm, do I notice anything? And, you know, you're progressive and iterative instead of just deciding ahead of time what is true and diagnosing and the the agency thing is different too. I mean, if I teach you how your brain works, then I'm thrusting all the power back upon you instead of creating this container that a therapist might and saying, here's the label, here's the thing you're experiencing. Let me now do some top down, you know, restructuring. I, I kind of think there's definitely a room for therapy in many, many aspects of our lives. But I also think that many of the things in the brain and mind we should think about as resources we can train, not just as uh, illness or things happening to us blindly. So, well, that's my I, I think the, the mental training and the mind training, the brain training is really going to you kind of have this, uh, this agency, this, well, what are we going to do about it sort of approach? And, uh, in sports science, this, this occurred, you know, the, the players used to show up, they'd play every game, uh, they would train very hard. And, and these were the expectations of our elite athletes. And this was unwavering. Um, and then sports science got on, got into this like hyper monitorization. Oh my God, we're not, we're noticing some pelvic dysfunction. You probably should sit out tonight. You know, we can't lift weights anymore. We can't, we can't stress our athletes anymore. They're all overstressed. And we, we kind of lost the plot. And now there's been this, you know, recalibration where, you know, athletes are, you know, taught and reinforced to get after a little bit. And very similarly where, you know, we, we have this impact, we have these things uh, that are going to occur to us, hopefully not in the, in the field of play, but there are things that we can do about it. Um, you know, with neurofeedback being, you know, something I found really exciting. And I think you really nailed it with the guilt because it, I, with the name anxiety, for example, I would, I would meet, uh, you know, old family members, people that I know very, very well and their name, I would, I would struggle with it. And I would feel tremendous guilt. Like, oh, I, I clearly just don't care about their name enough. I didn't do mm. enough of like the card game trick where I put their name in like an important place in my house growing up and I can go open the cupboard and remember where that is. And I'm like, there's, there's gotta be a better way. And, uh, I'm really excited about, you know, the work we have ahead of us. Yeah, me too. I, uh, you know, my, my guess is just a few sessions in, you're probably just barely starting to notice any sort of subtle effects in the sessions, but this is about where it kicks off. So uh, we should be able to elicit some more moments of clarity, some deeper sleep. You'll probably have a few nights of really intense dreams where they're like really active and really varied. Um, that's a plasticity boost. When your dreams kick into high gear after neurofeedback, it's kind of like after the gym going, ooh, Ooh, I feel it. Ooh, nice. It's that like stretch feeling or that slight ache. You feel it's a good thing. In neurofeedback, you have uh, dreams. 
that are really visually vivid and the detail to have themes and tend and to have a travel that's been theme, missing so. for me for a long time. I really haven't had many dreams where I remember them, particularly growing, uh, waking up, um, or, or were like the residue at least of the feeling. Maybe you can't remember yeah. the dream sometimes, but you know yeah. how you felt. Yeah, that's uh, that's a thing that happens when your deep sleep is shorted. You, you need to make big bursts of deep sleep to create the growth hormone to then make the REM to then, con- you know, but, well, sorry, the REM happens anyways, but the deep sleep without that, you aren't consolidating or storing the experience of deep sleep, which means you're dreaming and then forgetting it because deep sleep isn't happening to help you uh, store it basically or have that experience. Um, but that, that should come back almost, almost always. A lot of neurofeedback is centered around a particular frequency in the brain called sensory motor rhythm, SMR, which is 12 to 15 hertz. And that is the frequency you, you uh, use to stay deeply asleep but also to not be physically impulsive, to control your body perfectly. So the cat in the windowsill watching birds, that completely still body and laser-like focus, that's a high SMR state, literally. And that compared to theta, uh, when SMR is low and theta is high, that's what we call ADHD. Hmm. You're disinhibited and reactive to stimuli. So you have the kind of interesting brain that makes a ton of theta, but when you're loaded up, it goes away. So you can like turn off high degree, like, like seriously crazy high amounts of distractibility that do not get in the way when you're on task. Well, th- th- when they introduced, uh, I forget the gentleman who, who helped me, I think it was Austin actually, who oh, helped yeah. me with the, um, the attention test. And uh, he's like, you might get bored. And I'm like, I'm not getting bored. I'm like, no, yeah, <laughs> I'm it's really crazy. How, like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill this you test. Yet. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. And, and yet, and yet your brain's got a little bit of that classic distractible, inattentive, a little bit spacey, but you also have the other flavor of like the brilliant, slightly anxious, slightly, you know, reactive mode. So this is a special flavor humans get. It's not exactly anxiety. It's not exactly ADHD. Those are two simple labels. You're a unique person. The map is not the territory brain map, not the brain, but when I can spot cold, rumination, perseveration, touch irritability, word finding issues, delayed recall, you know, lack of sleep maintenance, lack of quality sleep. When I can spot that cold on a brain map, now we believe them because because if I can see them and you believe them, okay, I believe them too. Yeah. And those are things you can change. Neurofeedback pushes those waves around. Like you have theta. Um, I'll show you that's about three, maybe more standard deviations on a bell curve, higher than average. Um, it's bright red blobs on the data sets. And you can usually um, change or exercise that tissue to the tune of about one standard deviation, one Z-score every other month, every 20 or 25 sessions. So it might take us some time, a few months, but in a few months, you can actually change your executive function control and your sleep regulation permanently. So I would expect somewhere over the next few weeks, there'll be this odd phenomena of you sleeping more deeply when you're asleep and waking up more thoroughly when you're awake and having more stamina on the second half of the day. That should be one of the first things we notice actually is kind of a broad shift as the speeds and the sleep regulation really starts to shift. I bet I bet that gives you most of what you were hoping neurofeedback would do actually based on your brain. I mean, that sounds like a trip to my, I, I guess I shouldn't say that with the fires, but a, a trip to somewhere wonderful. Um, Tahiti, sorry, it's a magical on place. On Maui, but, um, are there lifestyle factors, other things that I can do to kind of put this neurofeedback on steroids and, and, and really um, try to enhance the results any best which way I can. You can, you can. Now you do, you have some mindfulness practice, meditation practice already. We have teachers, we build in some privates. So we have a couple of private sessions for you that you can get some additional instruction if you need it. Or there's a practice group every Monday night at 30 your time, I think in the evening. So you can join that and practice meditation for 10, 15 minutes every morning, huge for building plasticity. So I consider this stuff part of a minimal viable practice, an MVP. What don't you skip in the morning? You get up, you hit the can, maybe brush your teeth. Can you do five sun salutations? Can you meditate for five minutes? Like what is the minimal viable here? Um, and, and it's your devotion, not your workout. You got to get in. Don't, you know, if it feels like a burden, you're committing to too much kind of stuff. Start small and make it regular. But yeah, so that's, that's the good stuff. The sleep hacking stuff. Don't eat before bed to allow your blood sugar to drop, which lets growth hormone build, uh, build much better. So, you know, the classic stuff. Um, there are other heavy lifters you can bring to bear to accelerate neurofeedback. Um, among them are... Um, 
uh, there's another form of neurofeedback. We may have sent you one. I haven't checked your kit inventory, but there's a blood flow device called passive infrared hemoencephalography. It's a, a forehead sensor mm-hmm. that uses infrared cameras to measure blood flow in real time. So you can learn to get a vascular pump of your brain to train oh, cool. the, uh, the fatigue and stuff you're experiencing. It's another form of neurofeedback, but I'll make sure we have one of those uh, for you. Um, hyperbaric medicine, depending on your access to resources, uh, hyperbaric is kind of expensive but very impactful when you stack it it's extremely impactful if you're going to add that be careful with neurofeedback they can mix in a very weird way so my rule of thumb when doing hyperbaric and most biohacks is dive last in a day it's your last it's your last intervention um, never dive before other interventions because you give the system too much oxygen and it changes in an unre- unreasonably fast way or you hyper normalize your brain and then you don't train the weak things the same way as you might otherwise. So careful when, when mixing hyperbaric with other biohacks dive last in a day of okay. interventions. Um, but I like the other hormetic stressors as much as hyperbaric and those are much cheaper. So I would encourage that sort of, uh, sauna and and or ice bath kind of lifestyle where you're doing two to four saunas a week. And, you know, if, if you, if you hate ice baths, no problem. Instead do contrast cooling where your sauna routine is 15, 20 minutes to heat up and flush five minutes to cool down in a cool shower back in the sauna and heat up a second time. So like a, a pump, again, a vascular pump. Uh, but the hormetic stressors I think are huge. And I think that, Building those things in, saunas, ice, or contrast cooling, uh, hyperbaric if you have access to it. Um, And on that note, I do want to kind of plant a stake in the ground here. I'm not a big fan of soft chambers of mild hyperbaric. I don't think they do very much. I think for soft tissues outside of bones, they can. And, And tissues that have blood flow, like your muscles, they can do a lot. So for doing rehab and stuff, they can be a nice tool. Or for lung stuff, a really nice tool. But for deep tissues without blood flow, like the brain, most of the brain um, and joints, I think you need hard chambers. You need two atmospheres is my take on it. And so all the biohackers who have their soft chambers, that's awesome. But I would say two atmospheres, breathing in pure oxygen is, is, is the only hyperbaric worth sort of like bothering with in some ways, unless you're dealing with skin and soft tissue stuff. And then beautiful soft chambers are amazing for wound healing, muscle healing, that kind of stuff. Um, so beyond that though, I, I think that some of the biohacks that are most impactful, you know, lifelong, the stuff your mother told you to do are, are the things for many of us that we need to build in, but they become a little bit nuanced person to person. Like there's the big topic of diet nutrition, but that's as much functionally serving your goals as it is sort of spiritual and ethical. So it tends to be a pretty nuanced topic, person to person. There is no best diet. And the best diet for like body transformation, body recomp, and insulin resistance recovery is very different than someone like you, who you're going to try to fuel high bursts of high output and healthy long-term brain aging. So those are a little different in terms of goals. I would want to tailor some of that to you. Um, I often later in the process help people dial in some nootropic or or, uh, supplement strategies that help lubricate things further. Your brain is one that would probably benefit or enjoy. I don't know if this is true, but you might enjoy N-acetylcysteine. There's these uh, front midline and back midline hotspots. And the one in the front especially tends to be lubricated by NAC and reduce our... um, reduce intrusive thoughts and obsessiveness and the mind spinning a little bit. And it tends to be uh, enjoyable for some of us. Um, And then there's another compound coming out later this year. And I have no relationship with this company in spite of how positive I'm about to uh, encourage everyone to go check them out. But there's a new version of omega-3 fatty acids being formulated that seems to be pretty magical in terms of getting through the blood brain barrier and causing recovery, supporting recovery in brain damage and in eye damage central nervous system, because most omega-3s can't get through the blood-brain barrier very well. You get very low penetration. But there's a new form, LPC-DHA, or LPC-EPA. And so it's phosphatidylcholine bound to omega-3 fatty acids. And because of that, you're getting a 6x penetration into the brain. And the research is powerful, showing recovery from brain injuries and eye damage in animal models. I mean, really powerful research. And there's a company whose brand is Lysoveta, L-Y-S-O-V-E-T-A. And I think the stuff's hitting the shelves later this year. 
any of my clients that have brain stuff. I'm a big fan of mega threes, but the landscape is a bit iffy with terms of what's out there and oxidation rates and what's actually useful. And there's a lot of noise in the mega three landscape. I think this is going to be another iterative, you know, leveling up of using fatty acids the same way mega threes were the first time we discovered them, you know, culturally in this country, 30 or 40 years ago, kind of thing. This is another inflection like that. And then beyond that, I mean, we'll make some changes with the neurofeedback. I'd rather make permanent changes than just tweak for you. But depending on your goals, depending on long-term, depending on how it feels, there's a compound for biohacking called cetacholine, which is a choline compound. And you will get a speed of processing boost and a word finding boost from that. Um, it'll make your reaction times a tiny bit faster, I bet, for you. Um, I kind of think it might be a little overstimulating for you and you may find it makes you less smooth. So I'm not sure it's a good compound. Um, again, I'd rather change the bottleneck and get rid of it than just patch over it. But acetylcholine is pretty good for long-term brain aging and brain health, and it seems to be pro-myelination, helps the brain remyelinate over time. So if you've got some wear and tear and oxidative stress that's a little extreme, you may have issues with myelination or with oxidative stress damage. So adding some CDP choline in a few times a week in the morning will be mildly stimulating, will speed you up, and will maybe help your brain make more thick, fat, and happy fatty tissue. And so... These are my longer term strategies, you know, mega threes, citicolines, uh, and then managing things like, I mean, this is not important for you or for any of the athletes listening, but you got to manage the sort of inflammatory aspects of sugars and free sugars. Carbs are okay, depending on the athlete and the strategy in your life. You got to manage your macros, but you can do a success. Humans can do a successful macro strategy as long as they aren't eating high amounts of all three macros. You yeah. can cut one yeah, and take, survive yeah. and perform well. Like you really can. There are athletes who are vegan crazy long-term distance athletes. They carry around giant panniers of vegetables on their 100-mile century rides, but like they can do it somehow. You, can, you, you can't do that and have fat and protein in high amounts. Things fall over. Tissues oxidize. So I think for someone like you, know, you, it's pretty moot. You know how to dial in your nutrition. But if someone's becoming that high-powered machine, you, you know, among the best things you can do is leverage protein and get your good protein in and minimize your, your free sugars, you know, your easily burned sugars to essentially only food sources that are uh, vegetables and above ground uh, vegetables dominant and fruits and things. But those things are also again brain healthy general advice, not really super important for you because you know, A, you know what you need to do and B, if you crush a pizza on a Saturday afternoon, it's not a big deal for someone like you quite as much as it might be for a 60 year old, you know, grandma who has some prediabetes and, you know, it's a little different landscape. So my biohacking advice would be a little general to, you know, manage your, your carbohydrate load, inflammatory load, blood sugar load. Um, I use a device for that, uh, called the biosense that measures breath acetone. So you can learn to steer your acetone instead of using finger pricks for keto stuff. This can be useful too for figuring out what kind of carb ratios you can handle and dispose of reliably. So you can actually load up on carbs pretty aggressively and remain in light ketosis and get that benefit of easily accessible ketones. But also you can uh, sort of not you know, basically kill the sacred cows, ignore all the gurus and when they tell you you can't have X amount of carbs and instead figure out how much you can dispose of with your muscle mass sink and your awesome liver and your high output lifestyle, you can figure it out using acetone in your breath because it flexes one to two days. The enzymatic environment will shift to produce more ketones and burn them in your body and you get more acetone blow by. So you can kind of figure out the, the impact, the accumulative impact of two or three lifestyle, you know, sleep habits and weightlifting and diet macros and things. As they start to shift and change your, your enzymatic environment for energy, you can sort of steer that. And that can be somewhat useful for athletes. Um, we're trying to game their systems a little bit. They can find the edges of their ketosis and their uh, energy sinks that way. Well, it's very exciting. And, and, and to wrap up a little bit, I'm, I'm nearing the end of an off season, uh, you know, training camps right around the corner. I, one of the things I most enjoy about neurofeedback is how non-invasive it is. Like I'm not completely gassed after it's not, there's not a ton of sweating involved, right? Like it's not a, a physical phenomenon, which means it can layer into, you know, an already, you know, busy training schedule or, or ramping up, you know, gameplay. 
I'm very interested, you know, let's say next off season, we'll evaluate where my brain's at. I know you're, you know, uh, very into the Vince Duranda and some of the, you know, fasting protocols and things like yeah, that. Maybe off season we'll have you go low carb or carnivore. Not right now. You can, performance requires carbohydrates at the highest level, I think, to some extent. Uh, but also, you know, the, the neurofeedback should help you recover faster. I mean, that, you're just starting now. And as you go back into a season, I, I really want you to uh, let me know how you feel after games. Let me know how you feel after extreme output, how you feel after a hard workout or the next morning, especially. My guess is we really know we're on to something when the energy is coming up. But you also feel like you can handle a lot more without depleting. I think that'll be a real sign we're on to something. And that should happen, you know, soon. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Which is what I want. Like, I, I, I didn't want my stressors and problems to go away. I, I wanted to be able to answer the bell. Well, thank you, Dr. Hill. I really appreciate um, all your expertise and uh, our, our time today. We'll have to do it again. I, uh, we did. We got all the way to 3 o'clock when my 2-year-old will be waking up here. But uh, for other players in the, in the hockey community, uh, you know, I get a lot of parents of players on here, what's the easiest way for them to, to reach out if you're concerned about Yeah, so Peak Brain Institute is our main website, uh, .com, but we're also Peak Brain LA over all the socials. So come check us out. Uh, all your listeners get a discount if you want to come to one of the offices for brain mapping, or they can use that discount for remote brain training programs because most of our clients never see our offices. So you can work with us. We'll send you brain mapping equipment. We'll map your brain. We'll teach you how to do neurofeedback uh, wherever you are. So just let us know. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. I'll have a great rest of your day. My pleasure.